I'm Tara Spina, Assistant Professor of Entrepreneurship at INSEAD. It's a pleasure to present today what was about a year ago my job market paper. This is joint work with Arnaldo Camufo and Alfonso Gambardella at Bocconi University, and it is actually part of a very large research program on scientific decision making and experimentation. So what I'll do today is I'll present this particular paper, but I'll also take this opportunity to tell you more about the other projects in this area since there are quite a few and it is part of a larger effort to understand how entrepreneurs make decisions. So I'm going to start with uh, focusing on the scientific approach to clarify what it is right away with a famous example, Uber. So as some of you might know, Travis Kalanick came up with the idea for Uber in 2008. He was actually in Paris and he was struggling to find a taxi. And so that's when he had the light bulb moment and he realized, well, if there is an app for everything, why don't we just use an app for taxis? So he went back to San Francisco where he lived and he started thinking about what to do to develop this idea. And he realized that he had to have two things in place to go forward with this project. First, he needed to have passengers, so people who were struggling like him to get a cab. And second, he needed to have drivers who were looking uh, to offer rides to these passengers. He wanted to understand if his intuition was right, and so what he did was very simple. On the passenger side, he went to talk to some people who were queuing and were waiting to get a taxi, and he was asking very open-ended questions, such as, tell me what happened last time you took a cab, did you face any issues, what happened to you? And he realized that first of all, people, yes, were struggling to get a taxi, but in addition to that, they were also struggling to get fair estimates and split payment when paying by card and traveling with a fellow passenger. He did something slightly different on the driver's side, so he realized that the taxi industry was heavily regulated, so he decided to focus on private drivers. Private drivers often have uh, sort of bad time in between playbook rides and money to fill that time. So he Googled private driver San Francisco, cold called the first 10 numbers that came up. And of course, some people just hung up right away, but 30% of these drivers wanted to find out more about the opportunity and meet with him. And so for Travis, this was enough to say that he was up to something. Now, why am I showing this example? I'm showing this example because as Travis Kalanick likes to say, every problem has its own architecture. And if you find out what that architecture is, you can use it every time you face the same problem. This is the architecture that I see in this problem. Travis started with a theory, a basic, very naive justification as to why his business should even exist. He then broke down this theory into two educated guesses, very basic assumptions that he was gonna test about what he needed to be in place for his idea to work. He then conducted some tests, and yes, we can argue that these are very simple, naive tests, but uh, I think it's interesting to understand a bit more about how entrepreneurs think and run experiments. And some of the evidence that we have, and I'm referring here to a paper by Victor Bennett and Ronnie Chatterjee, uh, recently published on SMJ, shows that a lot of these entrepreneurs actually just talk to family and friends, and they don't even talk to experts. So in a way, these are simple tests, but they're pretty good in the sense that they're conducted with a representative sample. They include non-leading questions. Uh, based on this, Travis decided what to do. So this is to show you in a nutshell and in practice how a scientific approach to decision making works. Now, this is what I'm focusing on in this paper. I'm really interested in understanding whether a scientific approach to gathering and assessing information improves entrepreneurial decision making, and if so, how does that work? To give you some background, there is actually a previous study that I ran with my co-authors on this topic. It was also a field experiment conducted in Milan with a relatively small sample. This paper has been published recently in Management Science, but let me clarify what the distinction is with the project that I'm presenting today. So first, this paper is replicating the results of that study with a new sample, much larger, so 250 startups this time. And the goal here is to really make sure that whatever findings we're producing are quite robust. And I'm saying this because um, as you're gonna see at the end of the presentation, I'm very interested also in bringing what we've learned from this research to policymakers, entities that work to spur entrepreneurship. And we want to be extremely sure that whatever is coming out of this research is robust. And a lot of researchers in psychology, a field that is probably ahead of us in terms of experiments, 
are already taking this direction. So I believe that replicating previous work is essential. So this is a first important contribution. But on top of this, there is something that was not part of the management science paper. So in this paper, I'm gonna present a comprehensive theory that explains why uh, we are observing some certain results. And I'm also going to provide evidence consistent with this result. To give you a better sense in terms of theory or where the scientific approach comes from, uh, as I said, there are four different pillars that form the scientific approach to decision making. It is a relatively new label, but it is really building on a lot of different streams of research in strategy, entrepreneurship, and management. And so uh, typically research in this area is really focused on either one or two of these aspects. For instance, we have work by Sapo Fering and Zenger who looked at theory and hypothesis, uh, Felipe Cesar's work on mental representations, which is quite close to theory. Of course, there is a lot of literature, a lot of unpublished papers right now looking at testing and experimentation. And here I'm referring to the work by Surab Bosch, but also Rem Koning, um, Ronnie Chatterjee, and so on and so forth. But what we've done here, we really put all of these different elements together to see what happens when entrepreneurs don't just focus on thinking or doing, but combine the two in a very scientific manner. We are looking at this in the context of early stage entrepreneurial choices. So to fix ideas, let me clarify how typically in a very stylized way entrepreneurs make choices. We're looking at entrepreneurs who just have a business idea and they need to decide what to do next. So what they typically do is that they start with an intuition for a business they like to start, very much like in the Uber example. In the beginning, the idea is very hard to assess. It's hard to tell if the idea is good or bad. Entrepreneurs will then gather signal, and this could be, you can think of it as evidence collected by talking to family and friends or talking to experts, uh, reading market reports. It could be literally anything. But this information is typically used to make one of these decisions. So the entrepreneur can either continue with the original intuition and develop it, so stay the course, pivot or change something in the idea, or finally exit. And by exit, I mean abandon the idea altogether. So decide not to continue in developing that idea. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how a scientific approach decision-making affects this process of decision-making in the beginning of uh, a new business creation. What does the scientific approach do? The intuition of the theory is that there are two different mechanisms. So I'm gonna give you a preview here, and then I'm going to go into more details of each of these mechanisms. First, what a scientific approach does is that it makes entrepreneurs more precise. And by that, I mean that these entrepreneurs are actually starting with a clear framing of the problem that they're facing. They're articulating hypotheses explicitly. They know exactly what to test. So this makes them more precise. And in turn, this increases their likelihood to abandon the idea. Why is that? Because entrepreneurs are more likely to understand that their idea was not as profitable as they originally thought. And I'm going to show you more on this on the next slide. At the same time, scientific approach does something quite different. So entrepreneurs can also understand better when they use a scientific approach, what else they could do. You can think of it as an entrepreneur is testing one hypothesis. When this hypothesis is rejected, the entrepreneur can understand what parts of the idea could work, what parts could not work, and therefore has a better understanding of what else could be done in order to develop that idea further. So for this reason, I'm expecting them to pivot more, but especially to pivot in a more focused and precise manner. Let's look at these two mechanisms in turn. So the first point is about a scientific approach making entrepreneurs more precise. What you're seeing here are uh, two counterfactual entrepreneurs, a non-scientific one and a scientific one. They both have a business idea and a distribution, the potential returns to this idea obviously are very uncertain. So they have a distribution represented by the green curve. The entrepreneur will pursue the idea if and only if the expected returns are higher than a threshold or an opportunity cost. You can think of it as having an alternative occupation or doing something else with his or her time. Now, both entrepreneurs will gather information about the feasibility of the business idea, but they will do so in different ways. Starting with a non-scientific entrepreneur, what he or she will do is that 
they will not have a clear understanding of the problem that they're facing. They won't have clear and testable propositions. They are likely to conduct tests that are not very rigorous, not with a representative sample, without leading questions. And so this is very likely to result in noisy learning, which means that they are likely to learn something, but they're still gonna be in and around the original distribution. When we look at the scientific entrepreneur instead, so what you're seeing on the right-hand side of the slide, the entrepreneur is working with a clear theory, well-specified hypothesis, rigorous test. And this means that the entrepreneur is more likely to be able to estimate more precisely the value of the idea. So the distribution of value becomes narrower, as you can see with the red curve. And the consequence of this is that the highest expected value that the entrepreneur can gain is much lower. So this implies that the entrepreneur is more likely to abandon his idea. What happens instead when it comes to seeing new directions? Again, uh, I'm using a similar logic here, so you can see the two counterfactuals, the non-scientific entrepreneur on the left-hand side and the scientific entrepreneur on the right-hand side. Again, both entrepreneurs are gathering information about the feasibility of their business ideas, but in different ways. So what happens to the non-scientific entrepreneur? Again, because of the lack of clarity, because of the lack of rigorous tests, these entrepreneurs engage in what is quite noisy learning. And so even if they gather some information about what else they could do, they are likely to move from one business idea to another slightly different business idea in the same domain, but quite close to the original one. In the case of scientific entrepreneurs instead, you can think of it as being better able to learn about what they need to do next. So the idea with theory and hypothesis is that entrepreneurs can really understand why their idea should be successful. And so even when they reject some hypothesis, they are able to understand what parts of their theory could actually work, what would not work. And so they are more likely to understand what they can change in order for their business to still be feasible. However, we expect them to see a new business idea that is quite uncertain compared to the old one. And for this reason, as you can see, the distribution is wider. But at the same time, because the highest expected value becomes much higher, then they're actually more likely to pivot. And because of theory and hypothesis, they're more likely to actually pivot in a more precise manner. So they know where to go when they pivot. Let me summarize the predictions here before moving to the empirical part. So there are three key things that I'm gonna show you throughout the empirical part. The first one is that scientific entrepreneurs become more precise, perceive a lower spread of distribution of value of their business idea. And for this reason, they're more likely to actually abandon their business idea. The second aspect that I'm interested in is pivoting. And here the prediction is slightly different in the sense that entrepreneurs are more likely to actually perceive a new business idea that has a higher uh, distribution of value between two time periods and this means that they are more likely to move to an idea that has a higher expected value. As you can see in all this reasoning there is no uh, qualification as to whether these choices are good or bad. However, if we actually expect these entrepreneurs to make good choices in the sense that abandoning an idea was actually the right choice or pivoting was actually pivoting to a better or more profitable idea, then we would expect them to actually perform better. So this is proposition three. The idea is that if entrepreneurs actually select out bad ideas and pivot to better ones, then we would expect the scientific entrepreneurs to perform better. How do I test these predictions? This is with a randomized controlled trial. There are obviously a lot of details to this study and I'm mindful of time. So what I'll do is I'll provide a few important pointers, but I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have at the end of this presentation. But what we did with this study was to create a uh, pre-acceleration program. The first part of the acceleration program was a three month long training program created especially for this particular study. The three key steps, and I'm going to provide more details on them, were first of all to recruit participants. Participants are real entrepreneurs. So there was a call for applications that was published, both online and offline, that resulted in uh, more than 270 applications. Some were screened out because these entrepreneurs were already making revenue or they were quite a late stage. And so I was left with 250 applications. 
These applications were randomly assigned to either a treatment or a control group. The groups are balanced, as I'm going to show you, and they're both going through a training program that lasts for 24 hours. It's spread over eight sessions for three months. They're taught by the same instructors on the same days of the week, so it really try to minimize differences as much as possible. Groups were kept separate to avoid contamination. The only difference is that treated entrepreneurs learn about the scientific approach and entrepreneurs in the control group don't. And I'm gonna show you how this worked in practice with an example as well. The last important point to this study is the data collection process. So this was actually quite intensive, as you're gonna see. Uh, there was a team of research assistants that was conducting regular calls with entrepreneurs, and there is a total of 18 data points over 14 months. So to give you a sense of how long this study took, here is a timeline. So you can see that the training component of the pre-acceleration program started in September 2017. It finished in December. There was a break over Christmas and then monthly events from January 2018 until December of that year. Now, the treatment is only in phase one. In phase two, the monthly events, they were separate for treatment and control group, but the content was the exact same. So these events, for instance, were about uh, how to legally incorporate a startup, how to do growth hacking, these sort of topics that all entrepreneurs are interested in. And the reason why I was uh, holding all these monthly events was to keep entrepreneurs engaged. So as you can see, the data collection lasted for quite some time. It was sometimes burdensome for entrepreneurs to take part to a monthly call. And so they were happy to do it as long as the program was still providing value to them. Let me tell you a little bit more about the population. This is a picture I took from the program. Uh, we had actually quite small classes. So what we are seeing at the front, the guy in the middle, that's Eric, uh, one of the instructors. There are the two research assistants next to him. These are all entrepreneurs, and at the very back, you can see Arnaldo, for those of you who know him. Uh, but let me give you a broader sense of the population that we had. Uh, so most entrepreneurs were male, which is um, normal uh, for the population of aspiring entrepreneurs in Italy. The average age was 31. And I mean, as you can see also from the picture, there was actually a wide range of experiences in there but on average, they all had 2.6 years of experience in the sector their startup was operating in. Most of the teams, uh, about half, were based in Lombardy, which is the region where the training actually took place near Milan. However, there were actually quite a lot of people who were traveling from far away. So there were even entrepreneurs who were flying for two hours every other week to take part of the program. So it was actually um, a very uh, interesting experience. Uh, in terms of what these startups do, it is a little bit of everything. There were no restrictions in terms of sector or industry. And for this reason, I end up with a sample that is very varied. So there are some people, for instance, who want to start a fintech app. There are people who want to start a website to sell secondhand wedding dresses. There is someone who wants to open up a restaurant, really a bit of everything. Uh, but as you can see, the majority of startups classify themselves as digital, meaning that they either use internet or apps or some kind of technology-enabled service to bring their product or service to the market. But overall, these data seem to be in line with statistics available on startups at this stage in Europe. The group's overall treatment and control were balanced on a bunch of key covariates, going from education uh, to the time available to work on the startup, gender, uh, and some kind of assessment of the quality of the idea as well. So there are no statistically significant differences on these variables. What did the training program look like? So this was a fairly standard market validation program. So as I mentioned, we had relatively small classes. There were seven instructors who were all hired for this particular study. They were trained prior to the beginning of the study and they were given slides. So there's no chance to actually change the content of the course. Now, uh, I think an interesting feature of the design is that, and this was a choice, even though the, there might be some trade-offs, uh, was that there was the same instructor teaching to one group in the morning and one in the afternoon. And the rationale is that, of course, different people have different teaching styles, and this could actually affect the learning experience, but also the performance of entrepreneurs. And so doing this actually allows me to use instructor fixed effects as well, 
to try and account for that. So there are seven instructors teaching relatively small classes, and I'm going to show you why in a minute. And this is roughly what the content looks like. So these are tools you can see, business model canvas, customer journey, MVP, getting out of the building, that sort of thing, which are very popular in entrepreneurial education. However, as I'm going to show you, the treatment group was learning how to use these tools with a scientific approach. So what does that look like? Here is an example from lesson number one. The first lecture was obviously an introduction to the course and to the business model canvas. So the focus was really on explaining what is the business model and what is the business model canvas. There are 55 slides for this lecture, both for the treatment and the control group. About 20% of the slides are not identical. And I'm gonna tell you why. In the treatment group, the business model canvas is a tool used in order to represent the theory behind the business. And each cell represents hypotheses that will be tested at a later stage. And so entrepreneurs learn that they need to fill in the business model canvas, think about the logical connections between all the elements, write down a theory and write down hypotheses that they will test. In the control group instead, the business model canvas is just a tool that represents all the different elements that need to be in place for a business to work. So as you can see, these are relatively subtle differences, but I'm gonna show you that they can produce quite a sizable effect. Another important aspect is that, as you can see, there, are, there aren't necessarily many slides for a three hour lesson, and that's because both groups work on the business model canvas in class as part of the lesson, and they have a chance to ask questions to the instructors as well. So this is just to give you a sense, but similar differences are implemented across all the various lectures. Last part, data collection process. Uh, as I mentioned, this was quite an intense process. So there were about 15 research assistants. They were hired uh, for this particular study and they were given a script. So each um, week or each um, fortnight or each month, they would call some entrepreneurs and they had to follow a script. The script included both uh, open-ended and closed-ended questions. Um, you can find it uh, in the online appendix of the paper as well. But uh, the goal here was really to focus on two different aspects. The closed-ended questions were really measuring changes in the founding team and various performance measures such as cost, performance, pivoting, revenue, that sort of stuff. However, there were also some open-ended questions and the logic there was quite similar to what uh, Bloom, Varin, and Sadun have done with the word management survey. So really to ask these very open-ended questions to let teams emerge naturally. And if they don't, then research assistants are instructed to actually ask some non-leading questions to figure out if entrepreneurs have a theory, if they have hypotheses, if they're conducting tests without explicitly asking that. So there is a bit of both. Moving on to the results. So I'm gonna start by clearly showing you the management science results against the results from this particular study. Before doing that, let me clarify what are the key variables of interest and how they were measured. So the first aspect is exit, which as I mentioned means abandoning a business idea. So these research assistants were asking to entrepreneurs every time whether they were still working on the business idea or not. There were some cases, not many, but there were some in which the entrepreneurs decided to abandon the course, but not necessarily the business idea. And so in this case, they're not marked as exit in the sense of abandoning a business idea. But in the other cases, we actually tried to check that they actually discontinued the business idea. We also look at pivoting and we check whether there are substantial changes in the business idea. Now, this is measured by asking whether any changes were made to any cells of the business model canvas, which is what these entrepreneurs learned about in the first class and that they kept updated throughout the course. Uh, they could change anything in the business model canvas, but we are looking really at substantial changes either in the value proposition or the customer segments. And the last aspect is revenue. So whether these entrepreneurs reach the revenue stage or not, Understandably, as I'm going to show you, not many of them do in uh, during the observation window, which was 14 months. So first result, uh, what you're seeing in the next few slides are results from management science and the top part of the slide and replication results at the bottom. Treated entrepreneurs exit more. Now these results, as you can see in the management science paper with 116 startups, 
uh, was not necessarily that strong. So it wasn't statistically significant, for instance, in the panel data. With these new samples, so 250 observations, actually the results quite strongly point to the fact that treated entrepreneurs tend to abandon ideas more than entrepreneurs in the control group. With regards to pivoting instead, uh, the management science uh, paper results show that the entrepreneurs in the treatment group tend to pivot more regardless of the specification, cross-section results or panel analysis, they tend to pivot more. What we find is that in this setting uh, is that these entrepreneurs don't necessarily pivot more. So what you're seeing in the first column of the replication result table is that this coefficient is very small and not statistically significant. But uh, we're really finding that these entrepreneurs tend to pivot more once or twice, so a few times, as opposed to many times. And the maximum number of times for pivoting, and here we're talking about substantial pivots, is five. Uh, whereas in the management science sample, the highest number of pivots was actually three. So by running the same type of analysis also for the management science results, we're still finding that scientific entrepreneurs pivot more and pivot more once or twice as opposed to three times. But clearly, these results with a larger sample provides us with more variation to work with. Last aspect, so revenue. Uh, in the management science paper, there are some results. As you can see, they're not always statistically significant. So they are when we actually uh, winsorize or make some transformation to the data. However, uh, in the replication result, uh, what we are finding is that yes, there are uh, higher, higher revenue. These results are not always statistically significant. And I think they need to be taken with some caution for two reasons. The first one is that uh, there are many startups that reach the revenue stage in this period of time. So we're talking about, if I remember correctly, 17. So the number of startups that reaches the revenue stage is very small, understandably. However, in this analysis, we are keeping all the startups, including those that exit, with zero revenue. So it is quite a conservative result. Now, it'd be interesting to understand better what is going on in terms of performance, and I have a separate study on this, and I'll touch upon that at the end of the presentation. But let's move on to what is new to this particular paper. So the first aspect which uh, I was uh, very interested to see is what happens when these entrepreneurs are treated. So the first question that you might have is, we're all teachers, we all know that even if someone is sat in a room, doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna absorb the content that we're teaching them. So the goal here was to check whether treated entrepreneurs are more scientific in how they make decisions. So in this new study, uh, it was part of the protocol to actually measure scientific intensity or the extent to which these entrepreneurs were more scientific in how they made decisions. This is a combination of 16 different variables that are capturing different aspects of theory, hypothesis, tests, and evaluation. But what's important to look at here is that the treatment was actually successful in producing entrepreneurs that were on average more scientific than entrepreneurs in the control group. And I think uh, understanding better how the compliance work and who's more likely to comply is also another very interesting area that uh, I'm planning to work on. Moving on to the mechanisms and the theories. I'm going to go back slightly to what uh, I discussed earlier on as a potential mechanism. What you're seeing here is, again, uh, the intuition from the theory. So the first argument is that a scientific approach will increase the precision of the entrepreneurs and this will lead to more exit. In the empirics, what I've done is that entrepreneurs were asked, how much do you think your idea is worth on a scale from zero to 100? And this was asked regularly. So in other words, this was a way to operationalize the range. What this graph is showing you is that the blue line, so treated entrepreneurs, actually reduced your range significantly more than entrepreneurs in the control group up to week 20. After week 20, as you can see, this difference becomes smaller and eventually fades. What's interesting though, is that it is not just the treatment, but it is also the compliance to the treatment, so scientific intensity that is reducing this range. So it is making entrepreneurs more precise in the perception of the value of their business idea. What I've done is then I've used this variable range uh, instrumented by intervention, which is the exogenous variation introduced in this setting. And what this regression is showing you is that essentially a smaller range will result in higher exit. The reasoning is relatively similar to look at the other mechanisms. So seeing new directions and more focused pivoting. 
In this case, however, the measure is different. So uh, I'm interested in understanding what is the distance between the blue curve and the red curve. In other words, what is the difference between the value of the idea at times t and the value of the idea at time t plus one? So what you're seeing in the graph below, again, is that the blue line, so treated entrepreneurs starting from week 20, they actually start to have a wider range variation, meaning that and in the following time period, they actually see an idea or they have a wider distribution of value. Like in the previous case, I can show that it's not just the treatment that is increasing this range variation, but it is also the compliance to the treatment, so scientific intensity. And I've used this variable, again, instrumented by intervention to actually show that this is leading to more focused pivoting. And the reasoning is the same to actually look at what happens with this range variation and revenue. So what this is showing is that on average, this produced an increase in revenue of about 5,000 uh, 5, euros per month in the treatment group. So uh, I'm gonna wrap up and spend a few minutes talking about my future agenda and the future agenda of my colleagues on this. So what, uh, what we've done with this study is that we really looked at what happens when entrepreneurs use a scientific approach to decision-making. The idea being that they can select better ideas out and pivot to better ideas and therefore enjoy higher performance. There are uh, some results that replicate the management science of the first study and some results uh, that don't perfectly replicate, but there are some explanations as to why that is, in particular with regards to pivoting and revenue. Uh, there are some important contributions that this study is making both to the theory and the practice of entrepreneurship. So in terms of theory, this study is really providing a comprehensive explanation of different mechanisms that are driving entrepreneurial decision-making and choices. And the mechanisms are both increased precision at an earlier point, but also a, uh, an opportunity to see new directions that the idea could take at a later point in time. And all of this is driven by the subjective evaluation of how much a business idea is worth for entrepreneurs. In terms of practical contributions, uh, there is quite a lot of work going on. I think a first obvious contribution is to try and provide some tools for entrepreneurs and at a higher level really work with uh, policymakers, institutions that are trying to spur economic growth to entrepreneurship in really informing them in, to, in terms of what works for entrepreneurial education. So I've been talking to uh, different institutions that want to start accelerator programs, but a lot of them don't really know how to teach. And uh, this is actually a study uh, in, together with the previous one that really shows how some types of uh, teaching materials can be more effective than others. Let me tell you a little bit more about what else is going on. Of course, this paper is really just scratching the surface of uh, what we should understand in terms of entrepreneurial decision making and a scientific approach to experimentation. So first of all, this paper is providing some evidence consistent with the mechanism that I presented today. Uh, because of the limited time, I didn't go into, uh, for instance, excluding alternative explanations, which is a part of the paper that you can find online. But I'm really trying to nail down the mechanisms by using the transcripts of all these interviews conducted with the entrepreneurs. So I'm using some text analysis techniques and topic modeling to really try to understand what is driving these results, and in particular, try to disentangle theory and hypothesis versus testing. So I'm at the data analysis stage with this one. I have a, a separate field experiment conducted in London uh, and there is a working paper coming out soon uh, that clarifies what are the boundary conditions of the effectiveness of a scientific approach and trying to clarify what are the effects in terms of performance. Another very interesting aspect is trying to understand uh, what else do these entrepreneurs, do these scientific entrepreneurs do? So there is a wealth of data on how they use their resources in terms of time and in terms of capital. So what do they spend their money on? How much do they spend when? And so I am at the data analysis stage on two field experiments that follow the same protocol in Italy in order to understand whether this utilization of resource is part of the story that explains the success of scientific entrepreneurs. And uh, another interesting aspect, and it is typically a question that, that I get, is uh, what happens when entrepreneurs use other approaches? And 
uh, many of you are probably familiar with effectuation, which is a non-predictive approach to decision making, which has been very popular with educators and entrepreneurs. And so there is a project ongoing right now, just started a few weeks ago, so results won't be available until next year. But the goal here is not so much to have a horse race between approaches, but really understand what are the conditions under which one approach can be more helpful than the other. And last but not least, as I mentioned, I am very eager to share research and teaching materials, bring this to practitioners as well. So there is a website in the making, uh, www.scientificdecisionmaking.com. Uh, right now it is mostly a landing page, but there is a lot of material for research and teaching that will be shared there soon. So in case you'd like to be notified, please feel free to sign up and I'll make sure to send it your way when ready. And with this, I'd like to conclude. Thank you all for your attention. And I'd like to thank in advance Chuck for taking the time to read my paper, especially at a time when there is so much going on in California and it must be hard to focus on, on getting some work done.